Welcome to the Fit Filiate Podcast, where we talk about behavior and behavior-based conversations as they relate to CrossFit affiliate owners and coaches. My name is Lisa Hetherington, and I'm your co-host. Sitting alongside me are Tony and Chuck, the founders of Fit Filiate. And welcome back to another episode of the Fit Filiate Podcast, joined by the one and only Tony. How are you? Good, sir? Mid-drink. Yes. <laughs> And I have coffee on my forehead. I'm good. How are you, Lisa? Good. Timing is everything. <laughs> Timing is everything. Um, this week I really uh thought we can talk about one of the posts that you did for Instagram um regarding and it seems to be a very hot topic at the moment anyway, because all of the affiliate owner groups and the grams are full of people uh bitching and pl- complaining essentially that they can't find coaches. Why can't mm. they keep them and why can't they find them? Um, let alone trying to look within. But you did a great post the other day regarding, you know, three reasons why you can't find great coaches. And sure. you looked at leadership, vision, and mission. So I think sometimes that's that's really overlooked and glossed over, and I really liked, you know, the direction you had on that. So I thought we could talk about that today and dig into it a little bit. Maybe it's a topic that makes people uncomfortable because it's not the easy solution about you know, throw more money at the problem. <laughs> well, I mean, I've always said you don't have a problem if you can write a big enough check. So I guess in theory, you could just throw money at it and probably make it go away. But most of us, as you know, from enough other recordings, uh, most affiliates are not making enough money. So the number of dollars they can throw at the problem is certainly uh, limited. Uh, mm. But yeah, uh, I, I, I love that you always lead these things by being like, I was thinking about a post that you made recently. Like, that's not how you always choose these podcasts. <laughs> not all the time, but, you know, sometimes. Oh, yeah. Just... Well, it's either from there or it's something that came up on one of our calls or else it's like a blog post, which I don't really care. I mean, you can you could watch the chicken cross the road and be like, I think we should talk about the chicken cross the road. I'll probably find a way to talk about it. So I'm okay. Well, I it. think in the early days it was, you know, why are you asking this question, Lisa? What is it that you want to know? It came from <laughs> stuff that was either from my calls or, or things that I wanted to know, but we've we've kind of evolved from that now. You know, I'm just I'm standing on top of the uh, the soapbox and yeah. preach down to the fire. <laughs> it feels like sometimes, and I hope that doesn't come off that way. But no, um, no. So this is a that's a obviously it's it's something that's very near and dear to you know our hearts personally as everybody behind Fitfilia, but also the company. And I think that the eternal frustration and struggle, I think that it, you know, this, this supersedes even what's happening. I feel like I think the world as a whole right now doesn't necessarily understand like labor and labor shortages. And, and I think that it's, it's a very easy finger pointing conversation to take a toxism and bring it into this where, you know, it's, it's about other things. And uh, that was what preempted, you know, the posting or the creation of that post itself, but um, it really came out of, you know, uh, our internal meeting in regards to like discussing the clients and you know, universal struggles. And no matter how good things get, there's people be people in, and there's always other people mm-hmm. involved in the conversation. And that seems to be a central, you know, frustration, gray area or whatever you want to call it. But mm-hmm. that was really the motivation behind that. So what question do you have, Lisa? Let's start there. Well, what I was really fascinated by is your definition about, you know, leadership because we think about leadership in one way and also adding on to that mission and vision and and having, you know, the example that you gave in the post is, you know, we have a client that has 15 coaches and people coming to him all the time from within his community going, yeah, I want to, can I coach? Can I coach? Is there a spot for me here? Whereas mm-hmm. other affiliates don't necessarily have that problem per se. And right. I my thoughts were around is expanding on that concept of leadership in this con in, in this context as an affiliate um, owner to getting coaches and keeping them. So how long we got for this podcast? Because I feel like we about to go on some <laughs> tangents. Um, <laughs> first thing that I'd like to show and go on the record saying is that I hate the word leadership. Not because mm-hmm. I don't believe in leadership, not because you know, what leadership actually means isn't important. CrossFit as a whole, um, HQ as a whole even, but like the the ecosystem as a whole, I think has a way of gravitating towards 
things that are um we'll call it militant in nature right and so one of those things being hugely leadership and the reason i, I mention that is that leadership is so overused and so mm. overcomplicated in, in the crossfit landscape i mean really the, the business landscape in general you know, outside of the affiliates like the world as a whole i think you know with, with the advent of social media people have become very aware of the, their lack of leadership or their lack of someone to lead them because they get to have access to these other people and there's there's these platforms that they get to speak from and they're like man i'd like to i'd like to to work for or behind or be a part of somebody like that's organization so i think leadership gets a i think it gets too much attention um mm. for all the wrong reasons, you know, in terms of, you know, lots of toxicity that it creates and lots of, you know, you know, ego and, and, and authority and, you know, confidence and, and positioning to, to a certain degree. But like in that point and in that post was, you know, I think it's, it's easiest to understand that leadership is just simply your ability to lead other people, which is really purely just your ability to get people to follow. Mm. Right. And like, you know, don't overcomplicate it. So as we talk about leadership in this post, that's or this this podcast, that's all we're talking about. It's like, do people follow you, or don't they? Doesn't need to be any more difficult than that. Doesn't need to be any Goggins esque sort of like <laughs> get hard, motherfucker. Like it's just literally <laughs> like, do people, in your opinion, tend to follow you mm. or not? That defines pretty clearly that you're a leader or you're not one. Mm. And I think, um, you know, we can get a little bit lost in that space as affiliate owners where we think of leadership as in, right, it's like my way or the highway and I've got to, you know, do the things rather than thinking about, you know, are they invested, are they bought in, are they following? Will they, you know, run into the fire with me just because I said this is a fire we're going to run into, kids, this is where we're going, and everyone will go. Yeah. Um... You know, so the point of this was was really the three reasons that you're having a hard time finding employees or finding team members or building a team. And uh, we can get into all three of them. But I think, again, this is another reassurance. One of the things that I think comes out a lot of this podcast and really out of, you know, platforms like this in general is that we, we are very obviously affiliate centric and affiliate focused. And, and I want to be very clear on one thing. This is not an affiliate problem. Um, and I think that affiliate owners tend to now have this collective sort of belief about themselves that they are like, you know, inferior or lesser than business people. Like, dudes, mm. I'm telling you right now, anybody who's in possession of any business has, they none of them feel like they have any idea what they're doing at all. It's not an mm. affiliate thing. Like, it's just welcome to business. If you feel like you know what you're doing, mm. you're in trouble. Yep. Period. <laughs> Um, so, you know, kind of keep that in mind, but if I walk into any of the clients outside the affiliate community that we've ever worked with ever, or even inside the affiliate community, um, you know, to work with affiliate, like it's the same universal problem. Like yeah. there's a shortage of good, you can't, it's hard to find good help these days, right? Like you, you we've, we've all heard it. And so yeah. you hear this a million times, but there's also the old adage of, well, if everyone's the asshole. Mm. you're the asshole yeah that post wouldn't have the same i wouldn't have had the same effect <laughs> on if i made that one though if i don't I, know I, maybe i actually maybe made we'll... that post before and it didn't get nearly as much traction oh wow okay i was gonna say just uh everyone would would just click on that to see what it was about it's it is the common thing is and i don't and i like we've said on previous episodes affiliate owners in general and it's it's starting to change but for a long time, don't didn't see themselves as business owners. I've got a business, but it's really I'm a coach. I'm this, you know, and it's that story that we keep telling about. I'm writing this line, and everyone goes, "Wow, that's really impressive. You're doing this thing," and you're like, "Fuck, I'm just trying to hang on here." But I don't know what I'm doing. But I like this part of it. Yeah, no, um, it's funny. That's the post that goes up tomorrow. <laughs> Excellent. Um, disclaimer. I had the motivation or had the inspiration prior to the podcast. Um, <laughs> although this podcast will go out before that post or after. So in theory, this doesn't really make any sense to any of you guys. So <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I mean, you kind of nailed it, right? Like 
this is a this is a business type problem. So there's there's two types of business owners, right? There's there's people who get into business because they want to build a business. Um, you know, they have an idea, a, 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 an invention, a creation, a product, or something that they want to bring to life. Hmm. But the vast majority of business owners, small business owners, all fall into um, essentially the owner operator camp, right? The service based hmm. business. In that in that example, more often than not, the, the story that you see is somebody becomes very very good at what they do, and so the only logical solution is to go forth and do it for themselves, right? Like. Hmm. You know, and you, you see this all the time from gym owners, you, you see it in salons, attorneys, uh, you, 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 no matter who it is, you climb the ladder of personal development and success. And then inevitably you're like, you know what? I'm sick of putting money in Ted's pocket. It's time to start putting money in my own pocket. Right. And like, that's inevitably usually what ends up happening. And in their defense, they probably are arguably like some of the best at, that's ever done it. Right. Like best plumbers, best electricians, whatever. And, you know, best coaches and, and they, they go forth and they open this affiliate and their, their idea, their, their solution, I guess, is that I'm so good at what I do. Everybody's just going to buy it from me versus anybody else. And that should be the truth, right? Like, cause like yeah. if you're looking for somebody to put a new roof on your house, you're going to go find the best roofer, right? Yeah. But that's the operative word, find, yeah. right? And inside that fine conversation is a whole lot of other business-based conversations that people like affiliate owners are avoiding having. Like, and in the post that's going up, like I, I basically say, like, we could get in a time machine and we could go back 15 years. Like you could even find me being like, hey, my affiliate affiliates aren't conventional businesses. They don't operate like normal businesses do. They're different, right? Like, yeah. I don't even know what the fuck I was talking about when I said that. Really, and, and that's just me being honest. But I think that's one of the things that drew me towards affiliation in general is that, like, I had already owned multiple businesses at that point, and I had already been multiply annoyed by multiple businesses at that point for very different reasons, right? Whatever it was, you know, sales or competition or you know, saturation or you name it, like, universal annoyances are there. And so there's this idea, I think, that it lived in the ecosystem that, like you could go do this thing and it was a cream would rise to the top sort of scenario. And we would just like show up, we would build it and they would come. And somehow we all, we all became very collectively drawn to that. And then we all got there and realized that like in the post, I make the joke that I was like, we all got the gym class and realized we forgot our gym clothes. Right. We were just like, yeah. uh -oh. something's uh, yeah. not right here. Right. And like, and you look at, you look at gym owners now and it's still the same game, right? Like, they will spend thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year trying to find any way they can to validate that they don't need to learn about business. They just need to become a better coach, right? Like, and you watch it happen. They're taking courses, they're taking seminars, they're, they're leveling up, they're doing this, they're doing that. They're like, if I just become a better version of myself, more people are going to come in, right? And because yeah. what they're doing is making conversations based on past experiences, not on future outcomes, right? And like, before you decided to become an affiliate owner, you know, or before Ted decided to become a plumber, he became the best plumber, right? And so all you had to do was just become the best plumber. Same thing, with, like you just had to be the best coach. So you had to learn and learn and learn and learn and learn. You became the best coach. And so when you get into affiliate ownership and it didn't play out the way you thought it would play out, the natural solution is that like, keep doing what I've done. But you know, that old example there, right? Like, so. Mm -hmm. Let's avoid insanity and consider that potentially it's that, you know, we need to consider different inputs to create different outputs. And, you know, a lot of that comes down to the first rule of, of that post is that you have to accept the thing you don't want to accept. And that is that it is a business. And that means mm. you need to do business things. It is great. And you do have a huge advantage because you're the best in your business at your service level, no doubt about it. But it doesn't matter if people can't find you and finding you is a product of marketing. It's a product of growth. It's a product of you know, profitability and finance and all the things that we want to not be the case. Right. And I think everybody gets into this because they're like, you know, I'm going to be so good at this. I don't even have to sell them. They're just going to like throw money at my feet, like roses at a weird <laughs> wedding. <laughs> yeah. And you, we have all these delusions of grandeur and you see it, right? We all do that. Everybody does that back the napkin math. I'm going to get a hundred people. They're going to give me 150 bucks a month. That's going to be 15 grand a month. That's like 
10 times what I'm making as a coach right now. This is going to be amazing. And then you, you get in and then everything scales, including the expenses. Right. Mm. And then all of a sudden that, that enthusiasm, that, that dream starts to fade. And mm. then with that, so do you. Right. And so the thing that makes you uniquely you, these affiliate owners is that they are the best coaches, but then they get into business and they spend all that money and time trying to avoid being good at business. And then what ends up happening is they get burnt out, right? And mm. so now the only thing they were good at, which was coaching, they're not even good at that anymore because they're just like, that just kid. fucking do the burpee. Can you yeah. leave me? Just please just do the fucking burpee, right? Like, <laughs> and and so now we've got a double edged sword here, and it's a problem. And you know, I think that all this has very little to do with employees, but has everything to do with what we're talking about, which is like you're going to have to build something that people want to get behind mm. if you're going to get people behind it. And the first thing that you're going to have to do before any of that conversation has to happen is that you're going to have to stand in front of the mirror, whatever you want to do and get honest with yourself and be like, I'm a business owner. I'm going to have to do business owner shit. Mm. Well, it's, it's a bit like I was just thinking about um, a, a meme that I saw recently that, you know, when you're looking around for a, adult and realize you're the adult so you try and find an adult you're an adult and that's <laughs> you know what you you're in this thing and I, I i remember like during the all the lockdowns I, I remember saying to somebody i work for a government department you know there's a room full of people making decisions in front of the whiteboard now it's me and i've got the pen and i'm the only one in the room like that you know that's when it hits that you know live or die this is this is your Thing. It's not just all about, yeah, we're just going to throw down and it's great and I own this gym and it's super cool. And, you know, it's, it has more it's to it when you quote. actually have. And that's in that yeah. post, actually. It's just like, no, no, this is a business, but it's, it's like a, it's like a freaky business, right? Like you yeah. just put the cord quote in there because it's a circle, but it's like a, yeah. it's like a freaky circle. And, <laughs> and the rest of all your clients are essentially Thor. This makes no sense, mm. right? Like, because it doesn't, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we want it to be our special circle. We want it to be our freaky circle. We want it to be all these things. But like the bottom line is, is that your business is, is drawn to the same needs as any business. They just differ by degree and not by kind. And that's the post. Mm. And, and, and we have to start there. And, you know, we talk about, you know, as, as an owner, you get to the point where you're like, just do the burpee. Like, I just don't want to argue with you anymore. They're burnt out and think, God, I wish I had somebody to do some of these things. But to have somebody to do it like you, they need to want to follow you and be, you know, you essentially rather than just, hey, I'm getting paid 25 bucks to run this class. I'm just going to make sure nobody dies and that should be it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think, you know, like, I wish I had people who would would do this thing. And the answer almost always is they do. Right? There's actually, I don't know if I've really ever found an affiliate who didn't have at least a couple of people who wanted to do something and like help yeah. them, you know, be a part of it. Um, the question then becomes, what do those people want to be a part of? Because more often than not, uh, it's probably not the affiliate. It's a part of the bigger CrossFit ecosystem for various reasons. And that's, you know, we can get into that in a second, but you know, that's the, the first, you know, sort of big part of it there. But, you know, before that or operatively in regards to that, it's that like, you know, if you, if you find yourself in a position and maybe you are burnt out, but you need employees and you find yourself unable to find said employees or develop said employees or procure them or locate them, um, you know, the question really becomes like, what are they going to get behind, right? Like, what are, what are you trying uh -huh. to, what are you trying to find these people for? What are they going to, to be doing? What do you need them for? And then the answer to that question is usually some version of like, I mean, just trying to get some stuff off my plate. Right. Like mm -hmm. that's pretty much what ends up happening. Like, how fucking inspiring is that ever gonna be? Never. <laughs> or like Yeah, I hate like, here are the things I hate to do. They're now yours. You might as well just be like, <laughs> Hey, I made dinner. You want what's left of mine? Yeah. <laughs> like that's not like imagine coming home to that that homemade meal, right? But like mm. you know, bigger than that though, more operatively than that, I think is most affiliates have coaches. Those coaches are in a sort of defunct and in, in, in dysfunctional role um, for various reasons, but like they're not truly optimized and they're not truly utilized to the best of their ability. And, and the first thing that we usually have to ask everybody is like, 
well, have you tried asking them what you want from them? Like, mm. Affiliate owners are always universally just pissed off at their employees, and mm. yet they never actually communicated to them what they were hopeful that they would get out of this employee-employer relationship, right? Like that would be like being being the coach of your class and then being mad that nobody did the workout on the board or did the workout on the board the way you want to do, but you never bothered to instruct the class and tell them how exactly you wanted the, in the form would look mm. and the intensity would be and, and the expectations would be. And you'd be like, how would your class go? Terrible. Now you already know the answer to that. Well, that's exactly what you end up doing. You like you, <laughs> you hire employees like it's open gym and then hope that it's ran like the best class you've ever ran. You're like, what happened here? <laughs> well, you let the yeah. circus loose. I can that's exactly what happened there. But nobody wants to be the boss. That's the second part. Mm. Yeah, because we're you know, even in my own journey, I like early on, you know, pre um working like with affiliate and understanding some of these things was like, oh, I don't want to put on the boss pants. I don't want to pull the boss card because you know, we're all in this together. This is not, you know, my thing, this is our thing, we're all doing it together, and I don't want to have to pull in the Hey, I'm the boss. This is how I said. But by not setting those expectations every single time, it kicked me in the teeth every time mm -hmm. that I had not had those clear things about what was expected, even down to, hey, don't, you know, do a workout five minutes before you coach in your coach's shirt, please. Mm -hmm. It just it turned into, you know, it was it was always a just a shitstorm. Until I learned the power of clear expectations, what they expected and what I expected and having those conversations. Um, human psychology, like all things, exists in ironies, right? Um, and in the world in general is just one giant spinning irony. Um, but particularly all humans seem to to want to not have expectations, right? They, they believe this definition of freedom exists in this this absence of responsibility, but you've heard us talk about it here enough to know that like we define freedom as the intentionality of responsibility, right? And so that in and of itself is a giant irony. And really as that applies to like your, your the people or the coaches is, is the same sort of thing, which is like, you know, the people who are the, in the happiest relationships, whether they be personally, professionally or otherwise, always have the best expectations, like the, the greatest couple, they're very clear with their expectations between each other. The greatest, you know, employers, they're very clear with their expectation. You know, the greatest dog owners, they're very clear with their expectations of their dog. Like you've seen bad dog owners, right? They're like my dog is terrible. I'm like, you're terrible. Like you don't give any expectations. The dog doesn't work at all for you because mm -hmm. you, you, you don't yeah. want to ask it because you're like, Oh, I love it. I just, I just feed it treats and let it do whatever she wants. I'm like, <laughs> that's not what she wants to do. Right. Like, Mm. And she wants to impress you in, 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 in otherwise. And that's the thing, right? Like the point of expectations is not about oppressing people in, in exercising your control over them. The point of expectation is giving people the ability to exceed them. Like, cause mm. people are driven by their willingness and their interest in, con in contribution. And what that means is my ability to exceed. And that means mm. expectation. Like, I'm at my highest. All humans are at their highest. When Lisa, you tell me what you expect of me and then I over deliver. But if you don't ever tell me, I just, I'm like, am I doing a good job? Right. And like that lack of sort of certainty usually leads to a whole bunch of, uh, of problems. Right. And so back to the root part of this conversation, which was like understanding that first and foremost, you're in a business, the three problems that exist, as it applies to hiring a team in any industry, whether it be an affiliate or otherwise, I have this weird thread up here. I get rid of this thing. Um, yeah, I just noticed that before. <laughs> me too. I was like, what is going on up there? Um, our leadership, <laughs> vision, and mission, right? And mm. this, this is not an affiliate-based problem. This is everybody. In order for you to find a good staff or a good team, somebody has to lead them, whether it's you or somebody else. And if it's somebody else, then you're going to have to lead that somebody else. Right? Mm. In order for you to lead them, they have to know what they're going to get behind. And that's the vision, right? Like they, mm. what's this thing going to be about? And then the last thing is once I know the vision, what am I going to need to do so that I can exceed those expectations? What is the mission? Right? Like, mm. And those three things are, are universally absent of pretty much every employer employee relationship in every industry that things are yeah. going poorly, and but in every industry where they're going well, they're not. And, you know, in reading that post, I was struck by how, little 
um, you hear those three concepts discussed when talking about staff, team, you know, any of those things. It's about people don't want to work anymore. Pe- people are just part-time. They're hobby coaches. I can't afford to pay full-time. It's all these other things, but I've never seen it framed, you know, in that way. And you don't hear those things talked about. And I think one of the struggles that affiliate owners have is how do they tell the story of their vision and mission to get people to follow them? Mm. Like, you know, we've all seen, you know, Martin Luther King standing up and, you know, I have a dream and everyone's like, yeah, let's let's go run into that fire or William Wallace or whatever. But then for, for them to stand on their own hill and like, you know, let's charge into battle, um, they don't know how to do that to get people. And that's something I struggled with is this vision and this mission mean everything to me, but how do I get it to mean just as much to you and you just want to follow me into that fire and yeah. be as invested? I mean, man, there's a whole lot to unpack in that one. Uh, but <laughs> I think you, you're spot on, right? So where I think, well, first of all, um, <clears throat> whatever 97 percent of something like that of all small businesses fail because of being undercapitalized yada yada right like the vast majority of most small businesses again are are service-based businesses where somebody is very very good at what they do that says nothing about their ability to make other people good at what they do right like first mm. of all so it's not that surprising to think that like most businesses have a very negative opinion of employees right like the vast mm. majority of businesses like truly almost all of them consider employees to be your biggest line item expense. Mm. Like the first thing we have to reframe in this is that employees are not an expense. They're an asset. They should be growing your company. They should not be the thing that you have to spend money on to service the company. And it's a very important Mm. frame or reframe that people need to follow. Because if you think of them as like, I'm just hiring these people to offload some of my work so that I can go grow the company you're going to have a very resentful attitude towards them. But if instead you hire people and you think about your ability to leverage them and then they grow your company, that's a very different thing because that's an investment, not an expense. That's an asset, not a liability. And understanding that that's the point of hiring people is important. But I think most people don't have that opinion because the vast majority of businesses are service-based businesses where, you know, they are the world's best tree faller, feller, tree arborist, whatever you want to call them, right? And so inevitably they end up with too many tree felling jobs. I just think mm. that that's a funny word, felling. Okay, so now all of a sudden I, there's more trees than I can cut down in a day. I'm going to have to hire some people. And so you just hire anybody who's willing to wield a chainsaw and climb up this tree like a monkey, right? Mm. And cut down these trees. And inevitably, no shit, they're going to be way worse at it than you are. Mm. Right. And then, you know, next thing you know, you're, you're losing contracts because this, this ass had dropped a tree on someone's house or a car or, you know, this, that, other thing. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's because you didn't really think of them as an asset. You thought of them as like an expense and therefore you treated them like mm. liability. And guess what? They became one. Yeah. Uh, and, surprise. you know, I was just thinking as you were talking through that, you know, most affiliates find ourselves in the position we need to hire somebody when we need to hire them. It's like, oh, suddenly I need somebody today. So you're like, hey, Tony, you like getting up at 5 a.m., don't you? Great, cool. Do you want to be a coach? And here, start coaching. Here are some keys. It's like because we need someone now, we didn't have the time to invest, you know, up front in saying, hey, um, I'm going to grow and develop you so that when I do need you that I've got like a a, a catalogue to choose from, you know. Yeah. They usually that that need is usually I'm sick of getting up at four in the morning. Right? So you yeah. just kind of said it. But everybody's always like, I need a coach. I'm like, why? They're like, I just need I need more help. I'm like, you don't want to coach the mornings anymore, do you? And they're like, do you blame me? No, I don't. Um, but so yeah, so you know, all that aside, all of those you know, big picture theoretical foundational, you know, yeah. problems. You own a business and all businesses essentially have three criteria that they need. They need to be sellable, serviceable, mm-hmm. and scalable. I said that's essentially the the four or three metrics of, of your fitness in business. And um, in order for that to happen, undeniably, in order for you to sell the business, you can't be the guy there. Uh, in order mm-hmm. for you to 
service it, it has to be usable and useful. It means it's going to need to be bigger than you. And in order for it to be scalable, it's going to have to be much bigger than I, right? And so inevitably, right. themes become the great sort of tipping point in every entrepreneur's career because in order for you to get to the next level, you know, whatever level 30, whatever you want to call it, like at some point you're going to have to address this skill set, which is how do I get people on board? And that's mm. exactly it. How do I get people on board? It's not telling them what to do or giving them tasks or to-dos or checklists or otherwise. It's how do I get them on board? And so universally, the biggest problem that always exists in every industry, but specifically affiliates, is that there is no leadership. Most affiliates were born out of a love for CrossFit, probably what it did for their life or otherwise. And so mm. when it came time to open the affiliate, they likely put it on their credit card and bought their black goodness and they opened up their gym, but they didn't do it because they wanted to be a boss. Right? They didn't do it because they wanted mm. to be the leader. In fact, most of them did it because they wanted to be a follower. And this is really mm. the unfortunate part that happens in most affiliates is that a lot of people bought their affiliates so they could buy a seat at the cool kids table. Yep. Like the easiest way to be the coolest person in the in the CrossFit gym, you got two choices: win every workout. That hurts. And like, yeah. right? So <laughs> that's probably not going to happen. Or I could own this thing. That's mm. easier, right? Like I got a credit card, and and unfortunately, that's kind of what ends up happening. But then, like, you know, it's not as comical and it's not as minimal as that. But like, there's certainly, and if you're listening to this, you can. You can be honest with yourself. We all know that like, you're like, you know, this is an easy way to elevate my personal status and, and I get it. And, but even if it wasn't so, you know, insidious as that, nobody, everybody's always had a bad boss, right? So the last thing anybody wants to do is become the boss. And mm. that's, I think, one of the things that gets in the way in all businesses, not just affiliates, is that it's not so much about buying a cool a seat at the cool kids table as much as it's like, I don't want to be like that ass hat that I used to work for. So last thing I want, like, but nobody said mm. you had to do that. Like learn from that and build on that. Just don't be that guy. But we all think that like, you know, being a boss means like barking orders at people and micromanaging and, and all these things. But it has nothing to do with that. Being a good mm. boss is being a good leader. And, and this, is why, this is why people are obsessed with hiring, you know, military. Like, so I, people love to come to Tosh to be like, Mm. Do you mind coming and keynoting a leadership conversation in my industry? Tasha has no fucking idea how to build silicon chips or, 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 or you know, microchips in Silicon Valley. Like he's, but he's there because they want someone to talk about leadership. Mm. And you know, it's it's having that understanding that leadership is empowering people to take ownership and, um, you know, to run with it, and rather than just here I'm going to spoon feed you everything and this is exactly what's going to happen. It's as a leader, you know, I'm doing my job better if I'm empowering you to think and be creative and problem solve and rather than just coming to me with the problem, you're coming to me with the solution that you're going to pull the trigger on. Yeah. Um, you know, in regards to leadership, I think it's funny in, in specifically is this, this, military, this military ideation of, of leadership. Mm. Um, I think that when you use the word leadership, the first thing that comes to mind is like staff sergeants and like high ranking officers, yeah. et cetera. And this is always ironic to me because if you know anybody who's ever been in the military, they'll tell you that they're most usually the least organized companies on the, they yeah. nothing about them makes any sense except for the fact that they're hierarchical in nature. And I say this because despite all of that, militaries are really good at one thing, getting people to willingly run into the fire, right? Like, yeah. and so you know, when it comes time to think about leadership and you think about it that way, you're like, man, who's really good at getting people to do the worst thing ever? Like someone who's good at getting people to run towards a bad guy shooting bullets at them. Mm. <laughs> like, if you can get someone to do that, you'd be very easy to get someone to send emails, right? Like, mm. You know, and, but the thing is, is that you got to step further back. You have to detach from that because it's, it's rarely ever you know, about the commander or the sergeant or whatever. It's it's yeah. about the bigger picture, right? And so you know, this leads us into the division conversation. The reason why leadership is so prevalent in the military is that people don't sign up for the military because they signed up to be led by, you know, staff sergeant XYZ. Yeah. 
They mm. signed up for it because they wanted to serve their country and what that means to them. You know, like they were drawn to this idea, this idea of belonging to something that was way bigger than any person who's ever going to actually lead them. It was mm. they belong to something. And so leadership is essentially your ability to take people who want to belong to the thing that you're a part of and then lead them purposefully, intentionally and responsibly to do the things they need to do. And when you're the owner of the business, you have bought in that role until you at least mold somebody to take that role from you. But mm. it's your job above anything more so than leadership is to create the vision, mm. the flag, so to speak, to get behind the thing that yep. gets people to sign up for the military when they're 18, you know, and, and to join the army or join the Marines. Like, what does it mean to those people to be a Marine or to join the army mm. or join the air force? And that's your job as the business owner to create your Marines, right? To create your Air Force and give them something to belong to. And so when it comes yeah. time to find employees, that's what you're talking about, right? We're talking about giving people something to believe in, a vision of, of the future that is greater than the current vision or the current uh, uh, situation and something for them to belong to, you know, a greater yeah. cause. Leadership at that point becomes pretty easy. Mm. But I think we kind of gloss over that part as we develop our businesses and affiliates is, well, our, you know, our vision, our mission, well, you know, I'm going to be the best CrossFit gym and we're going to run the best classes and we're going to help people. And that's that's where we leave it because that's what it is. And we we buy into CrossFit's vision and mission. We go, well, that's that's the thing. And we kind of, you know, do ourselves a disservice by not actually digging into that and I know one of the like powerful things that happened to me early in my journey is when you know you guys took me through the four horsemen which is you know what's your vision and what's what's your mission and I wrote down whatever it was and like the feedback came back go think deeper like that's is that yours or is that the CrossFit um, vision and mission that you're just you're following mm -hmm. yeah I mean <clears throat> so every single one of our clients their journey is a little different, right? I mean, depending on where they're at, where they're trying to get to. But universally, I think every client in the history of ever has all started with the four horsemen, right? Which is mm. really just the cliche things that really people don't really want to be a part. They don't, they, they want to think don't need to exist, but we don't necessarily call it vision. We call it just cause, but what's your just cause? What are, what are your core values? You know, what is your mission? Mm. And then lastly, most probably most importantly, what is your why? Right. And so, mm all those things combined come together to create the thing that people belong to. They are your affiliates reason for existence and no doubt about it, no matter where people start from, it's almost always met with some degree of confusion as to why we're starting here. Right. <laughs> like I, uh. This seems like word salad. I need to make more money. Right. But like yep. until you solve for that, your affiliate does not need to exist. Uh. In fact, it probably shouldn't exist because at that point it's irrelevant. What people are going to get behind until you create your version of that is going to be someone else's vision. Right. And in mm. this case, the universal struggle is that absence of why is what's become wise and the absence of your why all the what's of CrossFit become their why. And so inevitably mm. what ends up happening is that your clients, your coaches, even you, um, and even the other gyms in town, other people, like they end up, be, they get on board with CrossFit's vision and ethos and yeah. mission. And that's a notable vision and mission. I absolutely yeah. no doubt about it. But you still need to serve your platoon's vision and mission to use a military term, right? Or like yeah. your, your branch's vision and mission. Because like we know that uh, the United States is going to go and try to win the war, right? But like... Yeah. It's going to take all of these other branches of military and then inside those branches, there's going to be all these platoons and all these divisions and all these, you know, regiments and, and whatnot. And they all have to have their own thing on board because if they don't, right, and you're just, we're just all here trying to like win the war. What the hell does that even mean? Right? Like, mm. you know, I guess I'll go that way and I'll go this way and you'd have everybody going sort of crazy. And so it's very important that in order, in order for an affiliate to exist, it needs to have a reason why. For the same reason mm. any business does, right? Like if you're building an app, you're building, you know, a general contracting company, you're building a, a bank, right? Like why does the world need your bank? 
Mm. Why does it need another one, right? Like, what are you going to do universally different that's going to make the world a better place because yours exists? And more mm. often than not, the thing that they will espouse is, you know, the United States is going to win the war, aka cross its vision, right? And that's mm. okay, but you need to understand it at a micro level. Like, how do you see yours fitting into that? How do you see yourself mm. playing a role in that? How do you see yourself contributing to that that only you can do and only your vision and your mission can do? And if you can craft and curate and, and create that, then that gives people something at a very tangible level to get behind. Because imagine being a part of like, you know, a hundred thousand people who just get dropped on some front line. They're like, okay, go win the war. That's essentially yeah. what it means to be a part of this bigger vision. But like, mm. we all want to be a part of something that we can touch, feel, and really truly exist in. And so like the four walls of your affiliate, that's why everybody felt weird when we went to Zoom calls. Because right? mm. they're just like, I lost that tangible thing that I could touch, feel, smell, be a part of, and like, know that I'm there. And, and that's the thing that you need to give them. But you need to be very clear as to what that is. And the reason we start every affiliate there is minimum effective dose. Every project that we put together for every single one of our clients is what are the most important levers that we can pull on the soonest, the fastest, and the easiest to make the biggest amount of change in mm. every single client case that's ever come in that is the single easiest most effective lever to pull on first and it's the most mm. important one because it makes everything else make more sense but and i say that only because the reason that is the case is that i've never taken a client console and in, in a diagnostic where it was clear mm. meaning i've never met an affiliate whose vision and mission was clear no and they're, you know, when they're coming in on that consult, it's, you know, and I I did it, came in because I was having trouble with staff issues um, or they just want more leads. That's what they think will fix it. It's like, yeah. okay, you want me to do this just cause and this why, but how's that going to get more people in my door? Like there is that initial disconnect up front where people, what people think will solve the problem isn't actually what the problem is. And I think where it makes the most sense is in the, is in the team conversation, right? Because mm. I think anybody listening to this should start to realize that like, oh yeah, like if I didn't give them something to belong to, no wonder they don't feel like they belong to anything and therefore they act like they don't belong to me and they end up mm. belonging to, 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 to HQ's vision, right? Like most of your employees and most of your clients aren't a client or, a, or an employee of your gym. They're a part of the bigger vision. And so this is why mm. like, they don't really particularly care much about the things that you do say or ask of them because they're just like, I'm a part of that thing, not your thing, because you never gave them something to belong to. And as it applies yeah. to, to the coaches, I think it makes the most sense because I think it's easier for people to be like, oh, yeah, if I don't give them vision and mission, how would I hire them to go forth and drive that mission? It gets a little bit more um, you know, philosophical as people start to think about it in terms of like bringing in new clients. But you can imagine that if you could – you could more clearly articulate your vision and your mission and your cause, et cetera, and, you, every, and your values were present in everything that you did, then your, your, your coaches, your employees, your team would then advance those missions, those visions, those values. And therefore, mm. then you would only be attracting people who were attracted to those visions, those missions, those values. And then the whole thing becomes self-propagating and self-reinforcing. And this mm. is how the whole thing has to happen. But it's also how you substantiate your prices. It's how you substantiate your, your service. It's how you substantiate like, you know, your scarcity, your urgency, all these things center around like, um, did anybody ever ask you two questions? Why does your affiliate need to exist? Mm. And uh, how you plan to sell this thing? If somebody would have asked you those two questions when it came time for affiliation, probably would have weeded out a whole lot of affiliates because everybody had been like, I don't know. I was just hoping to run like gym class that I could hang out in and wear gym clothes all day. Yeah. <laughs> I had a place to train Yeah, whenever I wanted. You know, and so yeah. it's, it's your job when you do get the keys to that thing and you do sign that lease and all your road equipment comes in, like you got to be clear on, on three things. You are the leader because unfortunately you've paid to do so, which means that you're not mm -hmm. the follower and you're not the fellow, which means that mm -hmm. you do have to be the boss. It doesn't mean you got to be a dick, but you have to lead them, which means you have to call them to action. And in order to do that, you have to be very clear on what it means to belong to your affiliate. In order to do that, you have to know what it means to be your affiliate. Why does yours need to exist? If you can tell me that, and then it's very easy to craft the mission because that tells me very clearly, how do I play a role 
in this vision, in this, this, this need to exist. And then as the leader, it's very easy for me to help you on your journey and exceed in your mission by giving you expectations that you can clearly intangibly and easily exceed. That's it. Like if you can do those three things and no doubt about it, anybody listening to this, there's a million things that fall underneath that, right? Like micro things and micro tasks, but at a big picture, these are the three universal problems. You've got to be the leader. You've got to create the vision and they've got to follow the mission. But if those three things don't exist and they never do, it's not a big yeah. surprise why no one works for you because they don't work for you. They just and, happen. And, 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 yeah, they turn up. And, you know, that even filters down to, like you said, that the, the people who want to be part of your community and tribe, they're drawn to that because they feel that they, you know, their values align rather than just, I'll just take anyone that wants to pay me 150 bucks a month. And, just, you know, you can't solve for the for the all. So if you know very clearly who you're solving for and, and what you're solving for, makes it way easier to spend your marketing dollars more eff- effectively and your efforts and your conversations that you have with people because you know that and you live that and like, this is who we're here to serve and this is why I'm here to serve them. Yeah. I mean, until you know why your affiliate needs to exist, you have no idea how you intend to differentiate your level of service. What are your classes going to look like? What are they going to feel like? What are they going to be like? Who's going to take them? What's 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 that going? What the expert? If you don't know why your affiliate needs exist, you're just going to run a class. It's a gym class, right? If you don't know why your affiliate exists, it's no surprise why people don't know what they're going to be a part of, right? And and so if you don't know why your affiliate exists, you don't know how much it's going to cost you to provide the level of service that you need to provide to make that existence a reality. If you don't know why your affiliate exists. You don't know how to communicate, right? And so when your marketing conversations come up and I say, how do you co- intend to differentiate yourself? You don't. You just start saying what everybody else is saying, which is classes mm. and, and programs and workouts and unlimited memberships and three times a week and maybe throw some mm. nutrition in there because of this or that. the other thing. Like if you don't know why your affiliate exists, you don't know why it exists. Well, and then, you know, and we talked about this on a, an internal call last week. It's, you know, people start to then gravitate with, you know, a particular, we are this gym because you follow a particular strand of programming. It's like mm-hmm. we are a such and such an affiliate. We are. And so then your who you are and what you stand for becomes this other, you become following somebody else's again, which is even diluting further down than following, you know, CrossFit's. Mm-hmm. And it gets oh, more and more be- lost. If you don't give them something to belong to, they're going to find something to belong to. And yeah. unfortunately or fortunately for you, because it's not necessarily a bad thing, because like if you're really, really terrible and you have zero interest in creating a why, a vision, or a mission, et cetera, you know, it's probably a great thing that they do have something so noble and so amazing like HQ's vision to get behind. But like, mm-hmm. don't be surprised that when you don't give them, a, you know, something to get behind, that they're going to end up behind something else. But like, dude, just look at yourselves. If you don't know why your affiliate exists, you likely are following somebody else's reason that it exists. And this is how you see people become, you know, XYZ affiliate or, you know, an XYZ, you know, gym or whatever this looks like, because you start following something else because Mm. you want to belong. Right. And, and then inevitably by extension, that means that they then need to belong. And then next thing you know, Mm. like, and your clients belong. And next thing you know, you're like, and you try to change something like your prices or something else. And you're like, no, I'm not paying for that. And you're like, well, yeah, but my bills are too high. So I have to charge you more money. They're like, I'll just go to someplace else where I can get it cheaper because they can belong to that anywhere. Yeah. And that is the, the thing that I think that we overlook a little bit is it kind of creates, and I know we've touched on this on other podcasts about that commoditization discussion. And also, like when you are that affiliate owner that's tired of running the, the morning classes, you know, you, you're burnt out. If you don't have that strong and compelling why that keeps you getting out of bed and being your best every day, that's when that stuff really kicks in and can be detrimental because you're like, you know, you don't know why you're doing it anymore. Like, why do I get up early and open these doors? Why do I fight for it to stay open when, you know, government shuts me down and all those sort of things? Is like, if you don't have that of your own to fight for, then makes it really, really hard. The community as a whole is after one thing accidentally. And one of the main reasons that like Fit Philly was born from the fire or from the ashes was that like 
there's a big push for standardization. And we've said it a thousand times, the biggest risk of the affiliate model, the single biggest risk is standardization. And that means like people going to the same version for help. You see like all of a sudden everybody's running the same challenge or everybody's doing this, or everybody's doing this thing and this thing. And like all of a sudden everybody's the same. Right? And like, the same so, everything. Yeah. So like, you know, be very mindful of the fact that like when you buy help or you buy a solution or you buy a, a service, is everybody else getting the same one? Because now you're standardized and there's only one thing that can come from standardization. That's commoditization. It's a race to the yeah. bottom every single time. There's no way around it because if I can get the same thing from other people that I can get from you, the question then becomes, well, where can I get it the cheapest? Because that's the only yeah. thing that you have that's leverageable against them. Right. And so yeah. there's two reasons why standardization is the biggest risk. The first reason is that, well, it makes us universally culpable in that if we're all the same and we all became a franchise, right? Just like you see this all the time with Chipotle. When somebody mm. got sick at some random Chipotle in California, all of a sudden nobody could go to Chipotle anymore. Now imagine mm. what would happen when some random person gets rabdo in Texas. Next thing you know, all CrossFit gyms are giving out rabdo for membership rates, right? Like you mm. can't have that for a very reason. And one of the reasons we've been able to survive so many storms, you know, due to danger and efficacy of the programming, which is all bullshit if I'm being honest. But like the reason we were able to survive this because at the end of the day, we could be like, it doesn't matter what Lisa did over there. We don't do the same thing. And everybody's like, oh, mm. so you guys don't like follow? Nope, we don't. Nope. So that's mm. problem number one. But problem number two is that standardization leads to commoditization. And the more similar the affiliates are, aka the less reason they need to understand why they need to exist, the more mm. similar they're going to become, which is going to mean that the model is the exact same, the people are the exact same, the, the people who are coming in are going to be you know, coming into all the gyms at the same time, responding to the same marketing, the same messaging, the same branding, the same vision, the same mission, et cetera. <sighs> CrossFit's already too cheap at 150 mm. bucks a month. We're now, we used to be the most expensive micro gym solution mm. on the planet, right? And like, but now the average metropolitan female has six gym memberships and spends almost $600 a month on memberships. Like yeah. we're not the most expensive, but I can tell you that every affiliate owner is making too little money and charging too mm. little prices. So commoditization is going to be a nightmare unless with that commoditization, we can do full scale, you know, standardization, which is like we can cost control corners like Starbucks do or real estate like McDonald's does. And we can cost control mm. all those things. And then, then we can commoditize the crap out of it. It's never going to work. No. And, you know, I think it's having those conversations and, and sitting down, having that reflection about it is about more than just, I need someone to fill a spot. Because if you hire someone just to fill a spot, that's what you're going to get. But then you're also going to add in your own frustrations because they're just filling a spot. Why aren't they giving me more? Did you ask? Did they know why it was important? Did they just want to give you more because they, you know, just want this dream to succeed? Like, and it's through you knowing those vision and mission and your why and your just cause. And how do you communicate that and get people to follow you up that hill? we're part of the world's greatest training program purely mm. like not only physically but like professionally like yeah the absence of skill is not a problem like, there is mm. no better training team on the planet than hqs in terms of leveling up and developing the skills necessary to do your job like mm. period it's interesting and ironic though that despite that there's nobody making really any money well, i shouldn't say nobody but there's a giant yeah. absence of people making good money in exchange yeah. for that that level of of service and experience and there is a giant lack of people who are looking to hire people being able to find these people right so it has nothing to do with skill it has everything to do with your inability to give them something to belong to they don't want to work for you because yeah. you can give them anything to work for yep and that's, I think, is a powerful note to end on as we put a pin in it. Like we could talk about this for hours um, yes. and no doubt we will revisit. That's so many key areas of the business, right? Like the same three things will segue into what are your rates? What is your marketing? What is everything that you do? And like, that's why everything has to start with vision. It's mm. weird. It's not necessarily the most sexy thing. It's hard for most people to figure out. But like it also confronts the elephant in the room. Maybe you just don't know why your affiliate needed to exist. And that's okay. Because yeah. from this day forward, you can change that really easily. Yep. But it starts with attention and awareness. Yeah. And having that conversation with yourself.
and you know being prepared to do that yeah or tone tone it yeah there is a link in the show notes of course to um have a chat to tony if you want to have some unfiltered tony time we've got a link and if you want to talk about your why and your you know what you're missing like he will be happy to talk to you about that not sell you anything but just talk to you and help you understand so click that link book that call it will change your trajectory even just that one call for sure all right good sir look forward to doing this again real soon always a pleasure thank you my friend for listening to the fit affiliate podcast if you would be interested in hopping on a free call with us to just kind of chat about what you think your problems are and what you think the gap is between where you're at and where you want to go we can see if maybe we can help you along that journey figure out if we're all a good fit to do some sweet things together So click the link, set up a consult. Let's help you identify some problems that we can mutually solve.